How Could You podcast. I'm Lauren Tossie. And I'm Ryan Tossie. And we're here to remind you there are good ships and wood ships and ships that sail the sea, but the best ships are friendships, and may they always be. Is that a quote from Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar? Yeah, I figured, you know, let's start this out really strong. I feel like you're saying that ironically, <laughs> and I actually like Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. We all know. We all know. It's classic. It's currently going up from here, I promise. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. If this is your first time visiting our episode, uh, we are two people who fell in love at a movie theater and never quite left. And today Help, we're... Let it get us out. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, God, today we are going to chronicle 2021, the year that was in film. I'm excited for this show. Like, I mean, this is a, a good, exciting kind of way to wrap up season three. Uh, talk about what a really interesting year. So now when you say interesting, so we're talking about like the f- the year in film as a whole, do you mean that positively or negatively or kind of chaotic neutral? Like, where do you kind of fall with how you feel about this year in it's film? It's a weird, it's weird. I don't know because I, here's, I don't, we're going to talk a lot about our favorites today and everything. And there were movies that I just absolutely love. I know you did. But I feel kind of like, you know, it doesn't seem to have that spark 100% that I wish it did. Because when I look at the year, it should. I mean, we have films from our childhood that are like, you know, being rebooted. And that were, you know, we have uh, Wes Anderson, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. um, We have Spielberg. I mean, we have Del Toro. I mean, we have great directors from this past year. So it should be a year that was just... Maybe one of the best. It should be rivaling 1999. Okay, that's big talk now. (laughs) But you know what? Here's the thing. I actually don't know if it's that or so much as, like, globally, I think the place we all find ourselves in. Like, there's a carefree way in which we would have approached this type of year in film previously. But think about what we were mired in. The first quarter of the year, I mean, the theater experience still felt very tenuous. Still feels very tenuous even at this point. Um, So you have, like, this return to the cinema that kind of happens or the return of the films that had been delayed finally coming out. And I think there's a weird amount of anticipation that these films were burdened with because they were something we were denied, rightfully so, out of safety during the pandemic, then come out during when we're still in a pandemic. So I think it makes it really complicated to view anything with the level of excitement of these films coming out in a year in the before times. I think you're 100% right, and I'm glad you said that, because I, I'm sounding a little more harsh than I mean to. Um, I, I do. I think that we're viewing, uh, you know, not everybody, I'm talking just from you and my standpoint, or even just myself, I'm viewing films, I think, with Vaseline over the lens, right? Like, there is just a little bit, I'm coming at it. I mean, we're all different people and and you were coming at it from a different standpoint. And like you said, there's an anticipation that's been building up now for years for some of these films. Ghostbusters alone, it feels like we've been watching the trailer for three years for that movie. Um, And then there's, I mean, we'll talk about Top Gun later on for next year, which that if it comes out. Right. So, yeah, you're I think you're you're spot on with that, um, that I think there's. Viewing the films, we're we're viewing them differently and and, and the way that we're, you know, watching them is different. So everything is, we're we're adapting to that. Well, and I think there is too, like you said, the way we're watching them is differently. Like, you know, there's a way in which our experience has changed. Like, I think there is almost this well, my films should be at home. Like, even if I have to pay for whatever it is, like the prime cinema or the the golden tier or whatever it's called for, like, Disney+, Plus. like, I think we all got kind of conditioned to it's, you know, safer to watch at home, to consume at home. And then now to kind of go back into that experience, I mean, I think event cinema is, re- I mean, really what it's becoming in a lot of ways. And listen, I mean, Spider-Man No Way Home was a really wonderful example of people really returning to the cinema, which is great, um, you know, and for theaters to have that, you know, or like kind of the big epic films that came out this year, like West Side Story as well with that. But I think there's a way in which we interact with media differently now. And I think just kind of the changing nature of it, it was starting in the before times, but I think, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, I think the pandemic, you know, exacerbated issues and changing tides in media that were already occurring. So I think it's, hard in some ways with how everything's been so stratified to really kind of hone in on what are those big movies because I think there are a few that I think will come up naturally today that we're going to talk about that were kind of the big films of the year but depending on how you're experiencing cinema right now if you've not returned to the theater you might not have had access to those films yet 
that were the cornerstones of the 2021 year in film. And we certainly fell into that trap as well with missing films that I know we would have wanted to see during 2021 that we're hoping to make right on very soon. So are there films that you wish we had seen that we definitely missed this yeah, year? Yeah, I'm with you. And and I'll be curious to see, because I have a, a large enough list of movies that I wish we had seen. I'm sure you were the same way. And it's interesting because you talk about the access and... I think that that is a, a huge thing. I mean, we're big cinema fans. Everybody knows that that listens to this. So we should be the the first people going out and, and different reasons. We didn't get to see all the movies we wanted to in the theater. Most notably, Nightmare Alley. Um, we haven't seen yet. Gilmo del Toro. I mean, it was on our, you know, list of... I thought that was going to be a secret just for us. <laughs> it should have been. Yeah, have I feel been. shame. I mean, and that's a big, I mean, that's a huge one. I mean, that was one yeah. of our top films to see this year uh, that we could not wait for, and we just haven't had a chance. The other aspect of it, I think, that happens is, and I think this happens for a lot of people, is with all the streaming services on top of the cinemas, there's so much content, right? Like, I mean, there is just so many films out there that no matter how much you're you know trying to consume it's hard to 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 take it all in uh, you do your best but it's not plausible so then you get a lot of great movies that we just haven't seen yet right the harder they fall it just elba yeah, huge, yeah. You know, um, that's one I really want to see. Dune was on both of our lists last year. We missed it off of HBO and the theaters, and we haven't rented it on streaming yet. Um, Lamb, um, A24 looks fantastic. Not going to be probably for everybody, but... Yeah, A24 film about a lamb boy from a couple that are having fertility issues. You and I should have seen that movie. <laughs> or maybe that's the reason we haven't seen it. It might be. Is <laughs> that too much information, audience? Probably. probably. <laughs> um, St. Maud um, looks fantastic. Yeah. haven't seen that. Uh, Coda. Oh, that's my... That's at the top of my list. I don't know okay. how we haven't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah I agree. I'd like to think that that will be one that during Oscar time, because that will, you know, we'll do a lot of trying to catch up with films that we haven't seen. Another two that Macbeth, I know has got to be on your list. The tragedy of Macbeth. I apologize. <laughs> I it's failed tragic. You. We haven't seen <laughs> no. it yet. And uh, Cyrano, I think, looks really, really good. Um, that hasn't come around to any of our theaters yet, right? Um, I think it's just hitting now. Okay. So, and, um, so those are those are ones on my list that I know. Um, I think The White Tiger was also on my list, but The White Tiger uh, was during the Oscar race last year. We haven't sat down and watched that yet either. So I'd really, that's another one that I would put on my short list of movies that we need to catch up from, from 2021. And I would say my list is not dissimilar. I have a few additions. Um, one is the Sparks Brothers documentary. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how, like, it, it's, it's the runtime. I, I know that's a lengthy documentary. Um, this, this one really bothers me because I thought the original trailer for it looked fantastic and it's been so well reviewed and people that I've talked to that, you know, respect their opinions on film have raved about it summer of soul oh yeah having not seen summer of soul yet kind of hurts a little uh having this conversation without that film kind of in the repertoire i, I wish we had seen it um and i know this is one that you and i kind of like waxed and waned on i still want to see zola if for nothing else i think it's a really interesting experiment i did read the twitter feed <laughs> or twitter thread um it's bananas um and i know it's a film if nothing else, and I don't know how successful it is, it seemed really interesting. Um, I think my my reticence of seeing it, like, right when it came out was, I was like, okay, so it's spring break. Like, that's, and that was, or sorry, spring breakers. Spring like, breakers. So, so I was just like, I'm not, I'm not here for it. And then. You wanted to do the voice from spring breakers, didn't you? I really you? think that's why I said spring break <laughs> yeah. and not spring breakers. Um but yeah, so those are the ones that to me were most egregious. Our list was pretty much the same. Um, you know, Lamb was at the top of my list and then right after that, Summer of Soul. So hopefully these are films that we take care of soon. For all the ones we missed though, we did see a lot of movies this year and I feel like we want to spend the bulk of our time talking about the things that we love. So let's get this out of the way. Let's talk about our least favorite films. Um, I think we each picked out three Right? No honorable mentions. Oh, but you know I love a good honorable mention or 12. No. <laughs> Follow the assignment. So we each picked three. We're just going to go back and forth. We think there's going to be some overlap. We did not discuss our list in advance with each other, and we're not going in any particular order for no, this. No, uh, no, I'm trying not to, for sure. So what is your first least favorite film? Oh, that <laughs> awkward wording, but still. Um, well, I, I did keep one off the list that was very close because I have a feeling during Oscar time. 
time I'm going to talk about this one. Oh, I know what movie that is. <laughs> um, but for right now, I'm going to go Godzilla versus Kong. Oh, that's fair. Um, I keep getting disappointed with these movies. Like, I keep getting excited. Uh, the first Godzilla, I was pumped. And then I was just a little disappointed. I saw the second one. We were in Ireland. I thought I was, like, so excited. We had had this long trip. I was going to sit down and watch it. Again, so disappointed. Loved Kong Skull Island, so I was hopeful for this one. I was like, yeah, let's pair them up. And it just didn't deliver. I mean, it was just... I get it. It's a giant monster fighting a giant monster. I, real, some of reality has to be let go when you're watching those, but, I mean, there has to be some form of, like, rules in your own universe. And to me, they were just making it up as they went, and it was frustrating and not real enjoyable and you lost me completely when you were able to you know take some train all the way across you know oh the Florida to Japan super train yes yeah. exactly which just shows the Millie Bobby Brown characters so unnecessary storyline in this movie and all of that not even talking about the spaceships that were just invented to be able to go through the earth's crust and get in the upside down so yeah just uh, Disappointing from from start to finish, but yeah, I guess my positive to it is it it looked good. It looked much better than the other two Godzilla films. How about I say you that? You are saying that with such caution. It's <laughs> painful. I so this is actually my first pick for my least is favorites it? as well. <laughs> yeah, because I think kind of the same. Um, you know, going in with a lot of excitement, I like a big spectacle. I think the problem is, as you said, like it's a universe that doesn't want to define its rules and feels like and. The next thing I'm going to say should be joyful, and it's not. It feels like two kids just playing with action figures going, like, the next thing, go on the super train. <laughs> like, it's just not, I'm not having fun with it because I think it's a film that's gotten wrapped itself tightly around wanting to have a mythos so it can have a larger universe, but then never define the rules of its universe. So it's really hard for fans to be invested in said universe, like an explanation of how the technology has advanced or an understanding of the lack security in this technologically advanced <laughs> facility. It needed something else and it should just be fun because that scene on the aircraft carrier when they have Kong and then Godzilla comes out of the water, that fight scene is awesome. It was real. The visual effects for this were really interesting and I enjoyed myself. The film needed to be a lot more of that and a lot less super train. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm completely with you. So what you're trying to say is Warner Brothers forced a cinematic universe and had no patience and just rushed it along. I feel like I know what one of your other picks is going to be from that comment. Because <laughs> I feel like that's a fresh wound. I mean, that's a little at the DC universe. Ah, but, yeah. but speaking of Warner Brothers, can I give you my number two? Yeah, go for it. Uh, mine would be Space Jam. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's where I thought this was going. <laughs> I mean, I know it's a kid's movie... And, like, I'm not sitting there saying that the original Space Jam was a masterpiece, but it does look like Citizen Kane compared to this film. Like, Space Jam, sorry, new legacy. Um, I don't like talking about people's acting, but LeBron James was just awful. Um, he, you know, it, it shows why Michael Jordan is the goat over him. Um, <laughs> to be fair, they tried to give him, like, a story. Yeah. Like, a, oh, like a, uh, yes, it, it was ridiculous. Like I an mean, emotional <laughs> core. And so just being like, no, it's he cool that you're famous. Have the, yeah, just be LeBron and be fun and be referential, but don't pop culture vomit what this film did. Um, this and uh, Ready Player One can rival each other of just, let's throw as many references that make no sense at you, but you love these things, so yay. Um, I, I mean, you get to that last 10 to 15 minutes of this movie, of the basketball game, and it's one of the worst part uh, things I saw in film this year. Um, and most of that is because you had to throw in all these things. You had the Droogs from A Clockwork Orange. Listen, I love A Clockwork Orange. Droogs don't need to be in a kid's movie. You have The Nun from The Devils, which is an X-rated film. Why is that in this movie? Like, I, I, I don't have kids. Like, I'm not worried about the sensibilities, but there's well, just gotta be. Well, I don't think be. you're trying to moralize anything. I think what you're saying, though, is it's like, when references are in or cheeky because they feel like, ah, the parents will maybe get this, that's great. But how many parents actually caught that reference? Yeah, fair. The droves they would have caught. <laughs> right. The, the not, like, come on. Yeah. That's not something, that's something that you put in to to kind of, I think, clickbaity in that yeah. way. Like, yeah, all there'll fair. be a video made about it in, in that yeah. way. I Listen, that didn't make my list, but I get why it makes yours. And I think LeBron James is a really interesting personality. We've seen him in other things where he has to act, but they just make him him, like... 
and they just, they lean into his humor. And this, they tried to lean into a, a more serious acting portrayal, which felt like really incongruous to the silliness of, I don't know, Don Cheadle being part of the Matrix. I don't know. It was very <laughs> right. confusing to me. Um, apparently, we just hated everything Warner Brothers put out this year because um, my next on my list is uh, The Conjuring the Devil Made Me Do It. Um, Fair. Apparently, we've got an axe to grind with Warner Brothers. Um, I, I was really disappointed in this. Um, you know, we got into the Conjuring universe late, and by that, I mean we've only watched those films within the past like year yeah. and a half. Um, and I loved all the other tales with the Warner family. Like, I th- find them interesting and terrifying. Um, we have the nun floating around yes. somewhere. <laughs> oh, she's around. <laughs> um, you know, and I like the Annabelle films. Um, but unfortunately, this, I think the problem is, is like, that is a news story that from a pop culture standpoint or a historical standpoint, most people know. So... They went really tepid with it, and then when they went big, it was so grandiose and so out of proportion to what I think even the Warners have documented happened that it felt like I can't even buy into this. I can't even get scared from this because I so can't buy into it versus the other more intimate, personal, family haunted house stories that they had focused on in previous films. And I understand the notion of like, well, they had some footing in it, but it's so out of bounds, so... That's um, next on my list. Yeah, I don't. I with you. I was disappointing it as well. Um, too big, and like you said, it, when you have a story that is so easily you can look up and and know how different it is. It's it's yeah. It just didn't land at all. So I have a feeling our last one is the same. Well, now knowing what we've said, yeah, there's no way that it doesn't. So end Step Brothers and say it at the same time. Sure, one. why not? What was your least favorite film of the year? Dear Evan, Evan Hansen. Hansen. Yeah. Um, yeah, let me let me just say this. It, it was the film. It's probably not the worst film by any means, but it's the film I was most disappointed in. Like, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Oh, that's so much worse. <laughs> um, the source material just means a lot. Um, we we absolutely loved it. We were lucky enough to see this on Broadway with. Ben Platt and just fell in love with this this musical and listen to the music all the time. Um, I got a great friend uh, who listens to this show and her and I have for years we you know when we're both down or having a bad day we'll we'll send each other you know kind of a dear Evan Hansen quote you know we, we talk a great deal about it it means a lot so I was excited for this film and when we went to see it it just didn't land and about the second song in I was realizing already there was a problem and by probably about halfway to three quarters I I wanted to walk out because I was so upset and disappointed. I'll say this. Look, I think the movie needed a better director, and you and I have talked about this before. I think they needed to age up the characters and say, like, this was happening at at a college. I I think that would have solved a lot, and also a better director at the helm. Here's the thing. You walk out of this film wanting to recognize people's invisible struggles. If you walk out of this film wanting to be kinder, if you take these songs and they give you points of inspiration or points, uh, you know, to kind of help you deal with hard times, then the film was successful and, you know, to hell with anything we just said. No, I think that's spot on. You're completely right. And that's something I've had to really think about with this movie because I've come at it hard on Instagram and, and talking about it. But at the end of the day, some people aren't weren't lucky enough to get to see this as a, as a musical on Broadway and this is their first introduction to it and it's probably going to hit differently. They're not going to have certain expectations with it and the music's going to hit. So from that standpoint, if this introduces people into this, this, this story and this world and you love it, please do love it and, and keep trying to find every version of it that you can look up, you know, clips from it on um, YouTube, you know, all these things <laughs> because, you know, yeah, the, the movie didn't work for us and, and we found it to be our, you know, least favorite of the year, but we still want the, the source material to be out there and people to love it. Speaking of things we love. Yeah. There are movies we liked this year. Uh, there's a lot of movies we <laughs> like. All right, so to transition, let's just talk about this. I so have a list of 55 movies. Five movies. We get to talk about five movies. Okay. Um, I'll need a moment. <laughs> so what we're going to do for this is the same back and forth that we just did. I think there's going to be overlap. I actually don't think there's going to be as much overlap. Mm, probably not. Um, it, which I'm, I'm interested to see. I also have five different versions of my list, just <laughs> so you're pre-aware. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the, the films that we really loved um do you want to start us off with a movie that you really attach to this I year i do can i say two things in front like, oh god okay <laughs> go for it no i want to say something 
there, I want to explain my list a little bit in that there are some things that I love this year that I'm intentionally keeping off of this list. And some of those are because in a couple of months, we're going to be talking probably about those movies a great deal um, at Oscar time. So I intentionally didn't even think about whether I wanted to put them in my top five or not. Uh, I really went with, no, these were the five films that when they were over, I just loved. Cool. Um, but my quick honorable mention no. is no. Midnight Mass. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know it's a TV show, but it feels like an eight-hour film that is just amazing. So watch it on Netflix. I just had to sneak that in there. We are the cosmos dreaming of itself. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that show is perfection. And why you've been listening to so much Neil Diamond lately. Had no idea I was a Neil Diamond fan until that show. Excuse me. Uh, I think actually when you turn 40, you have to legally <laughs> right. become a Neil Diamond fan. <laughs> um, okay. So what's your actual first one? <laughs> All right. Well, and we're not doing this in necessarily any order. No. Um, but I would go with um, Licorice Pizza. No, oh, okay. Um, licorice pizza would definitely make my top five. Um, Paul Thomas Anderson, uh, Lana Haim, Heim, excuse Heim. me. I kept pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, no shock there that I mispronounced oh, it. Um, and uh, Cooper Hoffman? Yes. Okay, Cooper Hoffman. Both. First time actors. Uh, so now Alana Heim is of the band Heim, so she's obviously very much show, you know, very much an artist. Um, Cooper Hoffman is Philip Seymour Hoffman's son. Um, a huge f- Paul Thomas Anderson fan, so that's going to obviously get me excited going into it. I think it's one of his. <sighs> easiest watches of his movies um and we're gonna get to the problem here in a second but um the movie is is funny um it's it's essentially vignettes put together um which i thought was really interesting that i didn't expect um and it's not in the you know truest sense of that but when you when you break the film down and how it plays out it's it's done over certain you know stories that take place over the relationship between these two characters yeah and i would say that's a you made a comment to me at the end of it and you were like it's kind of like dazed and confused it's kind of like american graffiti and i think that's a really good description for it and then we watched an interview with paul thomas anderson where he talked about those as major influences on this film so do you know uh what other movie he said that was a big influence of it i have a feeling i know fast Fast times at ridgemont High. high fast times at ridgemont high you can see the dna in this i'm i'm still convinced when they meet at the ball field that that's the same location right, from yeah. fast times i'm convinced because so, they're both filmed in the san fernando valley yeah anybody that listened to the first show of this season um knows that if you combine those movies into a film I'm going to love it. So, listen, it's it's funny. It's well acted. I mean, what Hoffman and Heim do in this movie are just brilliant. I can't wait to see what they do. Um, Cooper Hoffman's like his dad. Like, you're just... He's a showman, and that's what his character is in the movie, and that's what he is in real life, I believe. I mean, he... He's so damn charming in the movie. So charming. He's capt- like truly a captivating actor. Alana Heim, I, I, I want to hear her name come Oscar time, at least nominate it. Um... Then you have, and that's not even talking about, you know, Tom Waits is in this film, Sean Penn. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sean Penn's scene is Bradley Cooper. <laughs> so fantastic. Oh, Bradley Cooper's so good. Yeah, that's- so, I mean, it's, okay, so the, it's a, basically these two people that meet up and they, you know, basically have a bond and it's them trying to figure out what their relationship is. Um, that's really the long and short of what the story is. There's a problem with the movie. Yeah, um, so the discrepancy of the ages is something that I think... So here's the thing with Paul Thomas Anderson. Paul Thomas Anderson is a director that takes social convention and goes, deal with it, I'm going to make you uncomfortable. The problem is, is that, like, this film... And please understand, like, I love Licorice Pizza, and I think it's brilliant. And this is something I've been trying to reconcile, of the fact true. that there is a disparate age gap between the two main characters. Um I don't want to say whether or not that should affect your viewing. I think that's a very personal decision of how you enter this. Like, and I think, you know, I don't even want to say personal morality. I think it's like wherever your comfort level is. Like I had an assumption when I was watching the film that the main character that Alana Heim plays 
was lying about her age. In fact, I analyzed the film believing that she was lying about her age and it was going to be revealed later in the film. And this is not a spoiler because this has been well documented. Yeah. The character is 25 years old. Like, there's nothing There's nothing I'm spoiling for you about the film in and, that and way. And Cooper Hoffman's character is 15. Is 15, yeah. And, and to be fair, that's actually said literally in the first couple of sentences of the entire movie. Yeah. I agree with you. You and I reviewing it as her character, and, and if you see it, you'll understand, wasn't necessarily being forthright with her age. So I'm 100% with you. And I've had to think about that a lot since I've seen the film of of where it falls, and I was debating whether I wanted to put it on this list because of it. And it's a fair, it's a fair thing for people to question the movie. I say, watch it, come to your own, you know, decision yeah. on it. Um, there are... Um, bunch of different ways to view it once you know that and and what you believe you know where you can find a fault with it but i do think that there is something really uh special in the acting and in the storytelling it's just there is a a major plot line to this that you have to to understand yeah and i think it's a film that really like captures that moment in youth whenever that happens for you and that can happen for you when you're 15 or 25 when you're like reckoning with your identity and like what you want to do. And I don't even mean from like a career standpoint, just like what you want to carve out for your life. And I think you have two characters that are figuring that out at very different ages. Mm -hmm. One at 15, that's pretty self-assured about where he sees his path. And one at 25, who's, you know, a, a little um, unmoored in her life. And I think... I still think that there might be some question on her age, because if you read most of the things, it, it labels her as 20-something, even though she does say at some point 25. So I don't yeah. know if some people are still questioning on where her age does and fall. And that, that aside, it is, I agree with you, I think it's Paul Thomas Anderson's most accessible film um, mm -hmm. that he's ever done. I'm going to include Boogie Nights in that conversation, because I know a lot of people love Boogie Nights. Mm -hmm. um, I think the subject matter has a lot to do with that, if I'm being honest. But, like, I think that this is something that's really accessible and easy. If you liked Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it's got a real love letter to LA kind of vibe. So if, yeah, you, if you like I, that, then this is a <laughs> this is a film to 100% check out. It did not make my list, though. Understandable. Understandable. I was really torn. Yeah. I was really torn. Um, and I... and it, Oh, it's got great music, too. All right, anyways. But my first pick in my top five uh, is a movie we only saw days ago um, and it, it snuck its way right in there and that is the film Belfast. Got it. Understandable. Look, it's a movie about Ireland. <laughs> it, it, was, it, was, it was likely to be something I enjoyed. Um, Kenneth Branagh's directing, I think, find really interesting i one of my favorite marvel mo movies is the first thor because i thought he did really interesting things with that um i think often doesn't get enough credit for what he established with thor um now he did not bring in his sense of humor as much as has been brought in with later films particularly the taika waititi uh films but um or upcoming film i should say but belfast it's just a, it's delightful. Um, it's about a family in the 60s. It, this is semi-autobiographical to Kenneth Branagh's um, upbringing, um, you know, that are battling with kind of, unfortunately, a town that is in the midst of the Civil War uh, between the Protestants and the Catholics. Um, and looking at, you know, how do you, where is home? Like, what marks home? Um, is your identity tied to the place and everyone knowing who you are is identity forging your own path and and leaving a place and but taking that with you it's such a beautiful film there was a scene at the end of it it's in the trailer so i'm not again not spoiling anything between jamie dornan and the actress's name is escaping me um it's a real it it's a real celebratory moment in the film and it just works so beautifully and i just loved it it's beautifully shot um and it's just it's like a hug it's a, it's a it's a kind of a hug of a movie. I love. It. All right, it's a yeah, and then I, it's an Irish hug. Yeah, yeah, it's right. an Irish hug. Does that help? That's that's fair. That's very fair. Um, I. So you I, know how like Irish hugs are kind of depressing yeah. and filled with death. <laughs> Everybody go out and see this movie. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I get it. I get what you're saying. Um, it's. I'm totally with you. I It was a little different than what I expected um, because I think I was expecting a uh, cross between Jojo Rabbit and Millions. Um, and it doesn't quite, you know, because essentially you're um, you're through, seeing this through the eyes of the boy of the film and, yeah. what, and who I believe is supposed to essentially be the surrogate Kenneth Branagh. for Kenneth Branagh. Yes, yeah. um, uh, his character, uh, Jude Hill, who plays Buddy. Um, it's, I am with you. It's beautiful. Um, it, it would... 
if it if I I did there was one of the ones I left off my list be, or I didn't even think about putting it on my list because I know it's going to be so heavily talked about at Oscar time. I'm um, I'm ready to continue. Talking I know you about are, this. and I don't blame you. Um, I, I loved it. I, what he does some visually with some scenes are just uh, oh my gosh, incredible. yeah. The film's in black and white. Um, it's just, it's incredible. It's truly, like, Judy Dench's performance is insane. Um, you know, and one of the things I liked is, you know, he, not everyone on the cast, but he, a lot of the main casts are actually from Belfast. So there's, like, an authenticity to that in that way. Um, it's really great. It's, it's, it's intimate, um, almost to the point yeah. of, um, discomfort because of how intimately you're seeing this family. But I love it. But by no means for even with the subject matter and you know we're kind of joking about the the Irish hug aspect of things. Um it's it's a I don't want to say pleasant, but it's it's not this doleful watch, no. right? Um, it's it's really a, quite a beautiful film. There's a great line that's said by the at the beginning of the Irish were made to leave. Mm-hmm. And that and that is a cornerstone of the film. Um, it's a great. Yeah. I talk about it for hours. <laughs> or what's your next pick? So I stop talking about both. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, my number. My next one. I'm going to put on here is. Um, and I talked about it during Atasi's takes this year. Uh, is Pig, Nicholas Cage. Um, just love this movie. I can't talk enough about it. Yeah. Um, this is this movie that I thought was going to be John Wick, you know, 2.0 of, you know, and it wasn't it was something so different. Um, I am all here. We, we keep joking now on this show about the, the cage Um, <laughs> I I'm here for whatever he does. I mean, I know next year he's got what, um, uh, what's that movie coming out? Um, the unbearable weight of massive talent. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. I'm so excited for that film. Uh, but but honestly, I, I it's one of these movies. I'm just preaching to people. You gotta check out if you love film. Like if you just, it, it's a dramatic movie. Um, it, it, it's not over the top. There's nothing. It is literally a drama, and it's a drama about love. But it's told in the most unique way possible. It's about love and loss, and and Cage is just heartbreaking and and amazing in this movie. Um. I can't think of the general Max. Um, oh, Alex Wolf. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm thinking Max uh, Miguela, not Max Miguela. It's Alex Wolf, who you know was great in Hereditary and and really such a, a terrific actor. Uh, he plays a, a side character who kind of um, is with Nicolas Cage through most of this film. It's just I, like I said, it, you have to see it to understand. It, and it, I, I've. You know, I, I don't want to give too much away, and we're trying to be spoiler-free in this um, on this episode today, um, but I highly, highly recommend it. It's it's not what you're going to think. It's, again, a very understated film. Um, it's not over the top. Don't think of Nicolas Cage in his wacky, you know, ways. It is literally just a really terrific and well-acted movie and really well-written. And I think the thing with it is exactly important to note here is that it's hard to talk about what makes it special without spoiling it. So if you're like, wait a second, but what's it about? And you really just have to watch it. And I actually left it off of my five because I knew you were going to Thank include you. it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and, and I want, I, I, because you really pushed for us to watch it and I didn't want to, not that I didn't want to, I just had trepidations going into it. I thought it was going to be like some of the other kind of like more absurdist films he's been doing. Um, but it just wasn't, it was really special. Um, so that takes me to my next pick. Um, now, this is a film I talked a lot about during Oscar season, um, and because this year has felt like a weird time warp, <laughs> I actually forgot it came out this year. Um, and I would feel remiss if it had not been included in my top five, which is Judas and the Black Messiah. I love that movie. Um, I love that performance. I love that Oscars acceptance speech. Um, it's something that really stuck with me throughout um, the year, and then and then I kind of forgot about it for a little while, just because again, time warp. Um, it's just such a great film. I think it's so well acted. I think it's an incredible story. Um, I love how it was directed. I said a lot about it on our Oscars episode, so if you want to go back and listen to that, and we can always love the the bonus views. Um, definitely check that out. But it's an incredible film and something that if you've not gotten a chance to see yet, please, please watch. I think things oftentimes can get lost. Like we talk about them kind of with fervor during award season. You hear those names getting dropped. And then because of the cycle of like a new year starts or the year keeps going and you all of these films come out, 
and some films like this, I think, can kind of, like, they get their attention and then it's, like, kind of like they wane. It, please watch this movie if you've not gotten a chance to check it out. Um, it, I don't say it's an easy watch. Unlike Pig, where I think it's an understated film, this is certainly not because it needs to not be. It needs be. not be. Yeah, I agree. So it's something that's really important. I, I Please watch this movie. That's all I can say. And I'm not really, there's nothing really to spoil here or not spoil. I mean, it's a historical story. Yeah, so say, like, yeah. there's nothing I'm spoiling if we talk to even more in depth, but I, because I have talked about it. So if you've been listening, I have talked about this film at length. So I'll just, again, another plea, watch Pig and then watch Judas and the Black Messiah. It'll be a really <laughs> weird double feature, but watch both. Yeah. And, you know, it, when we do Tossie's takes or we do Oscar, you know, broadcast or shows, we talk a lot in detail about different movies throughout the year that we love. Um, so when you get to a list like this, you feel like you, you've discussed them a lot. And that kind of leads into my next pick, which I won't go into super detail because I know I already raved about it again as another Tossie's take, which is Tick, Tick, Boom. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we we had someone who uh, who texted me on the side and and said if you don't mention this in the 2021 year review that they'd be very <laughs> mad. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, again, I already talked in great deal about it in an earlier episode, but this is Lynn Mando Miranda's uh, directorial debut. Uh, it just sounds so weird. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author, <laughs> right. like, the Tony Award winner, <laughs> and Oscar winner, and like. Um, and it's it's a, it's a done again taken from a musical adapted um, about Jonathan Larson and the musical that he wrote after he had written a very well reviewed uh, musical that never got picked up by anybody um, and then he had to go on and do the next big thing which he wrote this tick tick boom uh, Jonathan Larson who would most be well known be most well known for Rent um, and also a Pulitzer Prize winning and author. also yes absolutely and. Uh, to me, the biggest takeaway from this is I think Lin Manuel Miranda. We we talked about this with Dear Evan Hansen about the directing. Lin Manuel Miranda though brings us into this musical. It's one of the best musicals I've seen. Um, that's you know that you feel like you're in the world, but you also get that stage aspect of it um, really quite well. And the biggest takeaway is Andrew Garfield. Um, yeah. I have been. A little bit, you know, I was not a fan of Hacksaw Ridge and um, some of his other work. What was the one we saw this year? Um, oh, Under the Silver under Lake. Under the Silver Lake. Um, so I had started to wait a little bit on the Andrew Garfield. And you know what? He's come back in a big way and this year. And this is the biggest thing. I, I mean, his performance is just magnetic. And, um, yeah. you know, you can't take your eyes off him. He is just brilliant. No, that's great. And honestly, I feel the same. It, I, it didn't make my list. Uh, but, you know, this is kind of, I will say where this becomes hard is like when you start listing these out, like you said, you have a list of 20 films. I mean, like same. And Tick, Tick, Boom's right in there. It's such an incredible film. It's one of the uh, best adaptations in terms of like its intimacy. I think it knew one to like have, there's a really big spectacle scene that I think works really well. And then the rest of it's pretty intimate. But you feel like inside of this artistic enclave, and that's what makes it, I think, feel really special. Um, and Andrew Garfield, just, he's so incredible in it. Like, it feels like he was born to play this part. And I never would, if you had told me when we saw Hacksaw Ridge that this guy was going to play <laughs> Jonathan Larson, I would have been like, why are they doing this to Jonathan Larson? Yeah. But now seeing it, man, thank goodness they did. Uh, agreed. Um, just, you know, there were three terrific musicals this year just four you know that came out and three that are just brilliant in our eyes and and this one is is at the top of the list from for myself fantastic yeah what is your next so taking it in a different direction yeah. uh bigger <laughs> blockbuster year <laughs> Shang-Chi and the Legend of the oh, Ten Rings. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, right. I love this movie. I So, all right, this is a Marvel household. Um, mm -hmm. We consume all Marvel. Um, and, and uh, so Marvel, you want to talk about that's a little known, um, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the TV shows, the films, everything, yeah. the shared universes, it's great. Um, so, and, and what's hard about this is I was making this list, I was, was like, look, Marvel... Marvel could have dominated my number one and my number two. They really could have this year. Uh, I chose Shang-Chi for a variety of reasons. When we went to see Shang-Chi, I don't know a lot about that universe, and I was so happy to be invited into it. The acting was so incredible. Simu Liu is just make him the leader of the next phase because he's got this. <laughs> um, I just felt like there was such an invigoration of like joy and passion in the film in terms of like the fight sequences felt 
revitalized. I didn't feel like I was watching something formulaic. I felt surprised by a lot of things. The character development was so fantastic. That opening scene, that kind of like, I would call it like a prologue to the film was so beautifully shot, really reminded me a lot of the artistic stylings, um, you know, particularly if you've ever seen Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, there seems to be like kind of some nods to that visual styling in that opening uh, prologue. Um, I just really appreciated um, Aquafina's humor in this. I also appreciated giving a character like her where I think you really could have used her for the punchlines um, to be the kind of person who is like the fish out of water, like coming into this universe and being like, what magic is real? This is crazy. Um, but to give her something that makes her have agency in this world, I felt like was such a smart choice. And it made me want sequels. Like it is a Marvel film that I went, okay, next one, please. Like I need the continuation of this story. And I think obviously that world will be a very big player in this next phase, but I just loved it. It felt big and grand and oh gosh it had so much like it had heart like I found my my eyes watering at the finale of the film and I was like well this is weird I'm I've only been with this character for this movie but they just it was written so well directed so well acted so well loved it top to bottom uh, I can't argue. Um, I was I was surprised how much I enjoyed it. Um, I know you just have been you know over the top. Uh, and I know much, you've been beleaguered with them. Like you're like uh, we'll get there, but yeah, Marvel fatigue. But <laughs> I was going to talk about that soon. Um, but yeah, I was surprised how much I enjoyed this movie. Um, only because I didn't know anything about it. Um, and kind of what you're alluding to, I was starting to get a little. Not that I dislike the films, it's just a little fatigue of them. Um, and and this one was a really nice surprise, and visually it was beautiful. I love the relationship between him and Aquafina, um, and how they the chemistry of them just as actors. Uh, they worked really well together. Um, yeah, really, really enjoyed this one. So I'm not shocked that this is on your list because I think you just watched it again the other day. I right? did. Yeah, <laughs> while I was making the list. Nice <laughs> on my snow day. Right. Well, I mean, if you're gonna give a Marvel. Then why All am right. I moving I, to I Marvel? I thought this might be where it was going. <laughs> um, so the next one on my list, uh, well, not next, because again, these are very much not in order, I promise you. Um, is this on your list, what I'm about to say? No, because okay. I thought if I picked this, there was a possibility you were going to pick that. Okay, all right, perfect. So We're literally the Spider-Man meme point. <laughs> yes, we are, right yeah. Um, and that goes mm-hmm. into, my pick is Spider-Man No Way Home. Um... And I just want to say this, I'm going to go very spoilers light in discussing this because I don't think there's any way to not. But if you have not seen this film and want to go in 100%, like, I know nothing about this movie, please fast forward a little bit ahead. I would say come back about like two minutes. Yeah, yeah, about two minutes. We'll go with that. So put me on the clock. On the clock. Um, And here we go. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, uh, Spider-Man No Way Home just was awesome. <laughs> I I I was vaguely excited about it. Um I I was like, "Oh, okay. I did not expect it to come out and just uh this movie moved me. Um it it had me excited. Um it rejuvenated my love for Marvel. Um this movie just it <laughs> It's the whole reason two movies don't make my top five list, because it's a film that brings back, um, is referential to old Spider-Man movies, and it brings those back into this world. I just can't believe they were able to do what they did with this movie. Um, It was emotional. It was exciting. Um, Visually, it was beautiful. You know I get bored with with fight sequences. And this was great. I think it just, I came out and I was so satisfied. It felt gratifying. Like, it was just like, this was so hard and complicated of a film to put together and they nailed it. Um, they just gave you everybody a little bit. Sure, we could nitpick at it and pick a couple eh. of different things, but I don't care. This movie was awesome, and I did not expect it just absolutely come out going, wow. Um, and it's just, it's fun. It's fun, and it's, it's just everything a Marvel film has been in the past and should be. Agreed. Yeah. I just, yeah, it's it's so, yeah, 100%, because we're getting down to the last 15 seconds before people should be popping <laughs> back in. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm keeping a lot of the things off. I, I think, like I said, I went light. I'm not talking about things. If you know, you know. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's the thing. Like, it's got surprises in it that are just, you know, I, you know, whether they're a surprise to you or not a surprise to you, it still hit, and that's the important. And thing. I will say, I think this movie has rewatchability because that's actually when I was watching Shang Chi, I was like. I remember being so delighted by it and so thinking, okay, this is the next phase. And then I rewatched it and went, oh no, this is the next phase. And this is such an incredible movie. And I feel like Spider-Man No Way From Home or No Way Home will 100% be that too. I think we will rewatch it and you will feel the same things. Yeah. I I don't think that's going away. I just think it was written so well and acted so well and performed and directed so well. And again, like these, this may sound repetitive, but it's like when things are your favorite films of the year, it's because they did all of those things correctly. Yeah, and this isn't just coming from a Marvel... If anybody knows me, normally Marvel films do not make my top five, top ten movies of the year. I love them, but they don't make... Because they, they don't have rewatchability to me. And like you said, I cannot wait to rewatch this movie. Which is crazy, because I'm like, oh god, I love rewatching Marvel films. <laughs> but I will say, I do fast forward past a lot of action sequences. <laughs> it's like, meh, nah, alright, I get it, you're beating up on each other. Um, so... I, I'm 100% with you, and I was, like, very torn. I don't know why. I was like, I don't know if I want two Marvel films on my top f- five, but, like, and Shang-Chi went out for me. Spider-Man, No Way Home went out for you. Going into my next pick, I would have, I, I don't know if I would have called this at the beginning of the year. In fact, in June, I would have never called it necessarily this, because I figured I was going to feel very firmly about one, uh, one film over another, and this was not going to make my top five. Oh, a West Side Story. Wow. You tricky fish, you. <laughs> wow. I mean, like, it sounds like so stupid to say when I think about it. Like, it's a Spielberg film. Come on. Like, but I, when when the slot of films was announced, all right, so back when this was, like, announced for 2020, and it was supposed to be in the Heights, and West Side Story were coming out in the same month, and I thought to myself, like, man, like, they're going to be naturally compared. They're both set in New York. They're both musicals. They're both going to be big spectacles. They're going to get compared. Um, and the thing was, is I felt like, well, no, like, I, I'm i so much more here for In the Heights, because here is the thing, and this is going to be blasphemous to my, my people listening to this who love theater. I do not like the West Side Story movie adaptation that came out in the 60s. How could you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. Um, for a variety of reasons. I never felt, I, I did the, the love story to me, just, I never bought the two of them together. I don't know why, I just like didn't. And listen, that movie's not without its problems. Um, uh, and certainly there, there are people who were involved in the original musical who even say, now, Rita Moreno, flawless in that movie. That, she is the best part of that movie. Um, this film adaptation literally took my breath away. I was watery eyed from about minute two <laughs> to the end. I had chills when Ansel Elgort sings Maria. I thought I was gonna like fall out of my chair. Like, like, like I'm talking like old school swooning. Like it was yeah, so. You turn to me and just <laughs> behind your mask, I see your eyes getting like huge, like ex- with excitement. I think, and I think I aggressively looked at you like you love this, right? <laughs> like, not that I said that, but I gave you the eyeballs of that. Um, there it, the the characters of Bernardo um, and Anita are so captivating, and I just love them so much, and I want to live within their story, like, again and again. I immediately thought, I was like, I can't wait till this goes to HBO Max or wherever it ends up, because I just want to rewatch it again. It was so... And I, I had heard a lot of people say, it's actually better than the original musical, or the original film adaptation. And I thought, that's like a high bar but I didn't think it was gonna actually be that high of a bar for me because I never really attached on to the original so I was like okay I might be more open this but this is gonna be the most trite thing geez that Spielberg kid can direct (laughs) um it feels ridiculous to say and I trust in him implicitly but he seemed again like uniquely qualified to make this he made a, a, a movie musical that every movie musical should aspire to be it was incredible and hopefully we get to talk about it a lot more during Oscars time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the thing you're talking about with Spielberg is the thing that I cannot even remotely deny with you. I, when we left it, you asked me what I thought, and that was the first thing I said. Uh, you know, again, it's Spielberg, one of the greatest of all time, but you can feel his passion in this movie. Um, and it is so 
so well directed. Dude, watch interviews with him about this. It feels like a man on a mission. Yeah. Like, this feels like a guy who was like, this is my passion project. Yeah. And, well, that was the thing is, like, he was in an interview and he said something is like, oh, so lucky to do this so late in my career. And I'm like, oh, no, none of that nonsense. You right. keep making movies, <laughs> sir. Yeah, I mean, and it's... you look like a kid on set. I recently had a conversation uh, with somebody at work and him and I were talking about Spielberg and just saying how, like, not saying anything negative about Spielberg, but we hadn't had that, like film that wow Spielberg in a bit and this one lands there a hundred percent um there are just things that he shot and I'm I'm really enjoying watching all the behind the scenes stuff with Spielberg uh on the making of this I'm really you know you and I probably don't a hundred percent land on where you know it's why it's not in my top five um there's some things that I probably felt a little differently than you did but I can't argue with it I mean if this Right now, if this would win Best Picture, I would be okay with that because it is Satisfied, yeah. a very, very, um, really well done musical. I, I in awe of how well directed and and the performances in it. Yeah, and here's the thing: there's nothing wrong with saying I can still be in awe of how well Spielberg moves a camera. Yeah, how well I mean, he lights. Please don't think that as a, a shot at it. I no. think it's still a great move. I mean, I think it's amazing, amazing. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a little surprised it made your top five, it did. and I think it's just been rising for you the more you know since you've seen it. Um, because I, I know the one that you know probably was close to making both of our lists, which was in the Heights. Um, I'm shocked that it. it overtook that for you. Yeah. Um, West Side Story, it just, it, and, and it, it's nested in there where I'm like, I want to listen to the soundtrack. Let's go see it again. Okay. Like, right. you know, yeah. You know, and that's why I said, we talked about, you know, um, Tick, Tick, Boom and West Side Story and In the Heights and these three big musicals. And then, you know, obviously we, you, we've already said what we feel about Dear Evan Hansen, but these three musicals, it just, the musical's not dead people. I mean, in a film version, it is alive and well, and, and they're, they're just really well done films. And you have three that, Right now, I think you and I would go, any one of them should be in the conversation for, for best film of the year. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So what's your next pick? Oh. Uh, this you know is what? your last pick. This is my right? last pick, yeah. I, and I'm going to give a little lesser known film uh, that made my list, again, kind of late in the game. And my pick is going to be Camille Griffin's Silent Night. I'm going to be really honest with you. I did not see this coming for like a mile. <laughs> I had a feeling this might be the shocker one for you. If I had coffee in my mouth right now, I'd spit it out. Um, I thought you were being ironic. <laughs> like, oh, it's a little known film. And then I thought you were going to be like, well, bam. Uh, so All Silent right. Night, it starts Kira Knightley and Matthew Good. Um, it is a, I, I mean, it's a straight up Christmas movie, but it's as alternative a Christmas movie as you're going to get. Um, it's it's a dark film. Um, I'm just going to say that. There's a lot of comedy in it, um, but it's very that dark comedy. Um, it takes place on Christmas, um, and it's essentially kind of like the invitation a little bit in that, like, everybody's getting together for a Christmas dinner. Um, it's all friends. And you know something's going on. Um, and I, I don't know, if you read the synopsis, you're going to know what this film's about. Um, but I'm not going to give that to you at this time. Um, it's yeah, no, do like I did and have no idea what you yeah. were agreeing to. <laughs> um, it is, it's... It's essentially about, you know, friendship relationships and, you know, coming to kind of understand placement in the world a little bit. And, you know, and, and it's got it's a very small film, but it's also got kind of a, a big overarching um, ideal <laughs> kind of yeah, message yeah. to it. Here's what I love about you talking about this film. Yeah. I know exactly what you're saying, yeah. but if you've never seen this, you have no idea what right. I'm saying. It's, it's, Just go watch it. It's a quiet, it's a quiet film, no pun intended. <laughs> um, and it's not necessarily getting a ton of great reviews. I'm not gonna lie, but oh, really? you know, yeah. But That's last great. year, I had said when I watched the movie Scare Me that if there was a movie I could pick, that if I could write a film, that would have been it. And that's what this movie is to me. Yeah. Um, it is. I love how it's written. I love how it's acted. Um, you know, I. I love a film that's that's comedic but very dark um, in tone, and it's a very interesting film. Um, and it's at times not an easy watch, but that's not to say that the subject matter isn't. It, it's it, it's just in tone. It's I'm not doing a great job of describing it. No, here's the thing: you really are, <laughs> and I respect this choice a lot because I don't think that this is a film that I would have seen on your top five, but I completely get it. 
because I think it's everything you kind of want in your horror now. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's, yeah, I mean, ultimately, you're right, it's a horror film, um, but it's, <laughs> it's, it, yeah, it, it, you're right, you're completely right, and I thank you for putting the words that I needed. <laughs> but this is what I love about your top five, you pick two films that you 100%, like, you can't really talk about and explain why it's so great without someone having seen it, mm-hmm. but I hope that this entices those of you who are listening to go see these films, because I think these recommendations you're giving are perfect for this year, mm-hmm. they're outside the box <laughs> right? and we definitely won't be talking about either of them come Oscar season no but oh my gosh go see these films yeah and, and unlike Pig which I think Nicolas Cage should have been in the conversation I agree but uh, and it's a short watch it's an hour and 30 minutes um and it doesn't need to be any longer <laughs> Um, but honestly, um, you know, please, yeah, go, go watch it. It's not a family friendly Christmas movie, but it's certainly a movie (laughs) to, to check out if you just want really good acting and well-written and a little bit of a dark, you know, kind of tone of a film. A little bit? (laughs) Movie straight messed me up. Yeah, I think to sum it up, the tagline for the movie, I believe, is it's the perfect Christmas gathering except one thing. (laughs) Oh, God. <laughs> so. Once you see it, you'll love that tagline. <laughs> so I have to know, what is, what is the last one on your list? Do you know what it is? I, um, I think I might. I think you have a guess, but it's not that. Oh, okay. Then I, I don't know. Okay. Do you have another, like, small indie film that no one's ever heard of? No, I went big splashy. All right. Perfect. Good. My last pick is In the Heights. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, it was so funny when you said it of like, oh, I thought you would have picked In the Heights. And I'm like, because I did. Um, <laughs> the whole point I wasn't allowed to do honorable mentions is so I didn't step on toes. <laughs> and I still stepped on your toes. I apologize. No, not at all. Because actually, I really love being able to say this. In a year and in a time where, you know, I, listen, so much is made about like how successful is still the Hollywood musical and does it still work and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, to have three films where you say like these are really successful and very different Hollywood musicals is a really fun year to get to have. Um, it's a year where I'm happy to say that I could have had three out of my five be musicals for my top five of the year. I chose not to go that route, but two of them did make it. Um, in the Heights... So let me set this up. Obviously, we are theater goers, Mm -hmm. lovers of the sitting in a a dark theater experience. This was the first film we went back to in the theater with a live audience. So it's going to have a special place because of that. I anticipated In the Heights from that first trailer so deeply. Um, I I was very fortunate. I taught at a high school that had done a production of this uh, years ago. That was actually my first time seeing In the Heights. I'd never heard the music before. The first time I saw it was a high school putting on a production, and they knocked it out of the park. We have a local um, like arts award show called The Freddies. It won at The Freddies, which was entirely deserving of. It was so incredible. It was so well-directed by uh, a woman by the name of Sarah Pastelak. Just did a genius job with this. So I felt attached to the story because I'd watched students perform in it. And then when the first trailer came out, I like you and I were like, this is going to be the greatest. And then, you know, it got delayed like everything else. But it's so delivered. It was so worth the wait. It was so beautiful. It felt alive. It felt electric. It felt like there's an excitement to being in New York City in the summer that is really hard to describe unless you're someone who likes being in the city in the summer. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a spark to it. There's like this kinetic energy that just vibes through the streets. And John M. Chu captured that with perfection. And it's interesting, you know, you have Tick, Tick, Boom on your list. This, you know, this musical, if you don't know, this is written by Lynn manuel Miranda. This is the, the musical that, uh, you know, is the predecessor to... Um, Hamilton, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, man, I mean, he had to cut his teeth somehow. Um, but this, and it's, and she is, he, he starred in it. He played, uh, the, the title or not the title, uh, the main character of Usnavi in the original production. Um, Anthony Ramos, who in the original production of Hamilton, um, played, uh, Philip and Lawrence, uh, cause if you know, act one and act two characters uh, or the actors overlap on characters, um, it's just great. It's beautiful it's it's spectacle um it feels like it's capturing this street in this neighborhood with a lot of vibrancy and a lot of very youthful energy it's got some great nods to like classic like busby berkeley like hollywood films um 
but in a modernized way, not in a derivative way. Um, it just, it's, it's incredible. And like, so I loved Crazy Rich Asians, uh, which is John Chu's film before this, um, because it just looks so beautiful. You just wanted to be in that world. And he, he captures that in this, but with also the deafness of being able to adapt a musical. It's incredible. Um, I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, again, like I, you know, if West Side Story or In the Heights gets best picture, I'm going to be really happy. I don't think In the Heights is in that conversation as much, unfortunately. It really should be. Yeah. Um, it came out in June, which is never a good sign, nope. um, but it felt like it should be a summer movie. So I feel like that's okay. I, you know, Tick, Tick, Boom and In the Heights are the two that if I get to sit down and rewatch, I'm going to rewatch those. West Side Story, I think, is is so well done, but it's not a movie that I think I'm going to be jumping out, jumping up to rewatch it. It's kind of a real bummer ending, too. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll say this. And I I don't say this often. I really don't care about the Oscars in this conversation. I just want people to love In the Heights. Yeah, I'm like, with you. Like, whether or not Academy, you know, energy comes its way, I just want people to love this film because it's so, so incredible. Anthony Ramos is spectacular in it. It's just everything. I love In the Heights. So that's a terrific five that you really picked there. And I know you and I are going to kind of talk about a bunch of the Almost, you know, here in a moment. and Are you talking about a free-for-all? A free-for-all. Yes. <laughs> but before we get to that, I, I do want to know, uh, uh, with your top five, are you prepared to pick, if you had to choose one as your favorite of the year, do you have one? Yes. Would you like to share it with the audience? Not at this time. Okay. <laughs> when will you like to unveil that? It's in the Heights. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. That doesn't surprise me of how much you liked it. And um, that's cool. I, I, yeah, I can't argue. I mean, you just painted a great picture of why. <laughs> yeah. I almost like, I should have downplayed it. So it would leave you all thinking what was her favorite <laughs> film of the year. It was in the Heights. Um, and it's hard because West Side Story has, has creeped into my mind in a lot of ways. And there are other films, and we'll talk a little bit about the free-for-all that almost ended up in my top five. One in particular that was not in my top five, but I think at one point was my favorite film of the year. So it's a really interesting, it goes through a lot of development. And I also, like I said, I had five different versions of this list. So before we get into the free-for-all, what was your favorite film of the year? It was very hard. It was it was a three-horse race or, you know, maybe a three-pig race. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> pig, I really wanted to pick pig. Um... And, oh God, I think I'm going to watch Tick, Tick, Boom over and over and over again. But at the end of the day, I, I, I'm I, surprised. I can't believe I'm going to say it, but Spider-Man. <gasps> Dude, uh, <laughs> I love that for you. Yeah. Uh, it just it just delivered to me. Um, and it, it delivered in every way I could have, you know, won it. Um, and, and it's hard. I mean, I, I really, it's, it's 1A, 1B, 1C with these three films for very, very different reasons. But but at the end of the day, I, I just, when I sat in that theater watching Spider-Man, it was everything the movie theater experience should be. But it also felt like the type of film that I'm going to be excited to watch on a small screen as well. And and that's really quite saying something. And, you know, props to it that I think it's the what it's doing at the box office right now is, is remarkable and, and really, you know, I'm excited that that there is a film out there that's being able to, you know, really rise above everything else that's going on to, to keep performing. Well, and honestly, it's the first time I've heard people in a long time, people having conversations of, oh, I went to go see it multiple times. Yeah. Like, yeah. I haven't heard that Great. in a while. I mean, um, you and I were in almost a sold-out theater when we yeah. saw it, so, and, and and I know that's not, that's not been the exception. I mean, that's been, it's still going very strong. So, uh, yeah, those are, those are our top. So, In the Heights and Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> big movies. Yeah, very big. Uh, can very, we have, can we have a free-for-all? I'd love to have a free-for-all. All right, last night in Soho. <laughs> all right, here, so I'm really torn. Um, okay, so right now what we're talking about is all these movies that, you know, Oh, we loved, but just yeah. if, if we had it narrowed down to five, but they need to be talked about, yeah. right? Yeah, um, Last Night in Soho, I think there's an argument to be made in one version of this list where it's actually my favorite film of the year. <laughs> I loved Last Night in Soho. If you know anything about me and my aesthetic, it should not be very shocking that that was one of my favorite films of the year. Thomas and McKenzie for the win. Love that movie. Go see it. It's tremendous. And it's probably in some ways my favorite. I think I listed on Arts Quest as my favorite film of the year. God. Well, and that's the I thing. I, I mean, that's always uh, the mark of, uh, you know, how much you love film, right? It's so hard to choose. It's why, you know, sometimes award shows are a little difficult because you're like, 
God, they're so different in so many different yeah. ways. So, and uh, so Last Night in Soho was definitely my honorable mention. It was. Uh, right it, I, I ended up going with Silent Night over Last Night in Soho because I'm right with you. Um, I, you know. Uh, one I want to talk about is Zack Snyder's Justice League. Oh, dude, good. Um, because good, good, it was good. an event, and that was cool. Um, it was just people were talking about it. There was buzz about it. It's a four-hour movie. I'm never going to watch it again, more than likely, or it's going to be years from now that I sit down. But it was so satisfying just sitting down one night, and it was like everything's off. Like We are just watching this event movie and that was at home and that's that's cool like that we could get that and um i want more of that type of stuff so yeah is it a perfect film no by no means but it was certainly better than what had been put out uh, prior and it delivered to me of a really good dc universe movie and it was like hey if dc had just settled in they could really have put out you know, some really great films. And I think we're going to get some of those coming up. But you know what I also appreciate? It got people talking about editing. Yeah. And the power of editing and the power of a director's cut. Right. It made people have conversations about that that maybe never even would have thought about it. Because, like, I mean, how often... It's normally, like, a special feature thing. But I thought it created, like, really, like, amazing conversations about the power of editing that I thought were really important and fun. Uh, My next on our free-for-all... I just didn't list it because I know we're going to talk about it like ad nauseum during award season, and obviously I've got a I've got a weird love for it. Uh, House of Gucci, like I love <laughs> House of Gucci. Like I'm not going to do any weird voices, I promise. But like I mean, like it's insane. It didn't make my top five. I love House of Gucci. It it delighted me. Adam Driver always, but you know. How's a Gucci is the, like, soap opera? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, are you Film. saying Days of Our Lives is your favorite TV show? Perhaps <laughs> not, but, like, you're watching yeah. it every day. You yeah, know? it's a fun... I, I was surprised I didn't make your... But I'm not shocked once you gave your list. Because it's hard. You only get five spots. What about you? What, do you got another one on the free uh, for all? Yeah, I mean, I could talk about a couple of different... Like, Belfast, Power of the Dog, sneaky, sneaky, sneaky good movie. movie. Yeah, because you think, ooh, this is going to be boring and educational, and yeah. then it's not. Oh, gosh, yeah, a Western film that was just like, I'm like, ugh, we're going to have to, you know, kind of get through this for award season, but it that one sat with me after, and I might be sitting here at Oscar time talking about that being one of my favorite movies of the year. It's so insanely uh, we well We literally directed. just watched it last night, yeah. so I didn't even want to put it anywhere uh-uh. on the list, but other, Nomadland came out this year, technically. No, that um, came out 15 years ago. Right. <laughs> In the days of yore. Um, you know, a movie that I want to say, uh, my favorite uh, cartoon of the year. You're going to put it? You're going to talk about Mitchell's vs. the Machines. Mitchell's vs. the Machines, yes. It was recommended to us by our friends, the Reardons, and you and I. It was just our total sense it's of humor. so funny. Yeah. I'm like, hey, everybody that wants to show your kids Space Jam, please show them this instead. Okay, relax on Space Jam. <laughs> relax. You had your time. It's a, it's a, Really fun cartoon uh, or animated film on Netflix that that we both would definitely recommend. I think one of the because la- I had that and I think the other one. This is like on the opposite end of this. Um, Candyman. Yes. <laughs> Nita Cost is Candyman. Yep, that was in my 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 list of yeah. Uh, with you, it was one of the best shot films I've seen. All yeah, year. it's 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 dizzying and disorienting. Uh, it plays with like art form and and kind of the the rules and also I think kind of like the class system that kind of like infuses within like the art world and how we and how we process art and how we perceive art. What is art? Uh, it, you know, quote unquote, really big there. Um, it's so incredible, and all like also it's like a like a good horror movie, but like it, but it's a lot. There it, it, there's really interesting conversations I think happening throughout the film. I know we talked about it during Atassi's takes, but yeah, um, and that was at one point would have been in my top. It, this is where the top five got. Yeah, see. I mean I'm with you. The Candyman one was I really wanted to put it in here. Uh, it's not universally loved horror film. You and I both liked it as a horror film, but no one can deny what. Nina DaCosta was doing it uh, with it as a from a director standpoint. No, a hundred percent. You know, speaking of horror films, <laughs> were you surprised to um, you know new <laughs> you know old throwbacks didn't make my list? Okay, so here's why I'm not mm-hmm. because I don't think you can say with a straight face that Halloween Kills is a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> I got asked at Christmas, "Is Halloween Kills good?" And I went. No, it's a terrible movie, and I loved every second of it. And that is how I feel about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, once I had to take my fandom out of it, it's not a good movie. Um, it, it, the script is all over the place. The directing's sloppy. Um, you know, it's ridiculous. 
But it's a horror movie that, that, you know, that's what we wanted to see. We want to see Michael Myers go around Haddonfield and we see these characters. It's not the type of movie I needed to be high art. It just was a film that I needed to feel like yeah. I saw a good, fun, fun in that horror film sense uh, horror movie. So, yeah, Halloween Kills is one of my favorite films of the year. It's not, though, a good movie by any sense. No. And you also didn't have Ghostbusters Afterlife. <laughs> Neither of us did. And, we didn't. And I came out of the movie sobbing <laughs> and happy. I'll tell you why I didn't make my list. Why? Spider-Man. Ah. Uh, that's all I'm going to say with that end of it. But Spider-Man. Uh, I gotcha. Spider-Man made me realize where Halloween kills in Ghostbusters Afterlife fall in those, in those type of films. Without being spoilery, I know where you're going with that. On one of those films, I definitely disagree with you. Okay. I, I. But I do see where you're going with that and why Spider-Man No Way Home made it This is what I want to say about Life. Ghostbusters Afterlife. If you haven't seen it, I won't go... I won't be spoiler, but what I'll say is this. When Ghostbusters is its own movie, I think it's amazing. Um, when it wants to be referential to the original... I think it hits these nostalgia moments that I want, but I don't know if it's as uh, tight a film as the other parts. Disagree respectfully. <laughs> Listen, at the end of the day, I'm with you. I mean, I was, I had my Ecto-1 popcorn bucket. I was a little kid in that theater. Uh, it's, you know, the score, everything. I love that movie, and I cannot wait to rewatch it again. I absolutely love the movie. It's just... You know, there are some things I could... Yeah, nitpick. Yeah. Or picky nits, as some other podcasts <laughs> might say. So with this, and kind of like looking at the year that was in film, you had brought up this interesting question that I thought was fun for us to tackle on the podcast. So you had asked me if you could take any one of these films that came out this year, not necessarily in our top five, just a film that came out this year, and either give it a sequel, prequel, a remake, or a recast, which one would you do, and what form, and why? Do you want to tackle this first as it was your question? It is. That made my brain hurt. No problem. I'm glad. And I am I'm cheating. Uh <laughs> So you can talk about another film you wanted to talk about. No, it? it's not. Um, because I actually had a hard time with my own. Okay. And I actually, and I will go very quickly with my explanations. Because uh, I, I know we've talked. My sequel, I am actually ended up doing almost all of the questions. Oh, instead no, of okay. just picking right. one. My sequel is Licorice Pizza. Because I need another film to <laughs> explain or justify <laughs> the problem with the movie so that I can still love the rich of the movie. Um, so I, feel I need, that. <laughs> my recast would be Dear Evan Hansen. Because uh, yeah. um, even though I, I we have problems with the director, I think I think unfortunately Ben Platt was too old for the part, and yeah. I think we should have gotten a younger cast. And listen, I was promote I want it. Ben Platt in that, but in the end, I was wrong. It just, um, and then the other one is my prequel. I want to see an Anita, Anita and Bernardo film. Oh yeah, because um, from West Side Story. Yeah, from West Side familiar. Story. Ariana De Rose and I apologize. I don't know the gentleman's name that played Bernardo, uh, but those two characters were two of my favorite in all of film this year. They are just wonderful, beautiful interesting, um, dynamic characters. And I just want to see, I wanted to see more of them throughout yes. the entire movie. Um, Honestly, I think if you had just made the films like centered on their love story, yeah. like, it'd be, like e e even take it like a step further, like, cause it's just, their love story is so, it's magic. It's and, and, hard not to fall in love yeah, with Yeah. And it. credit to the actors. It's actually part of the problem with West Side Story for me, not a problem, but why it falls a little bit is because to me, they were more interesting than the two leads. Yeah. And, they steal. And they steal yeah, it. They so. do. I, I don't, I don't disagree there. I think at times they can steal it. So thank you for letting me cheat a little bit <laughs> <Yes>. there. <laughs> you did heartily. So mine is actually what I was accusing you of, and it was in service to be able to talk about a movie that didn't make my top five, oh, but I wanted geez. to talk about. Um, I want a sequel to The Green Knight. Oh, gosh. I Thank yes. you. Thank you. Yes. So, um, A24 was directed by, I think, David Lowry. Um, it's incredible. It's so... So, if you read the Arthurian legends um, at some point during your educational career or for funsies, 
um, the Green Knight story was always my favorite. Um, and it's a so it's an A24 telling of an Arthurian <laughs> legend. So take that with however you will. Um, it's really it's visually interesting. It's super moody. Uh, I love it so much. And I'm like, I kind of want to see it come back to like the round table and then like just see someone else's quest. But then like you have hints of all the other quests like going on. I don't yeah. know. I just I want a little bit more because it was so good. And to me, like of all of the ways in which people have tried to tell, I think the thing that Arthurian legends like film adaptations often miss is there's meant to be some level of creepiness and horror to all Arthurian legends. And I feel like they, the film adaptations don't lean into that. This one does. <laughs> and it's great. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, Dev Vitell is is brilliant in yes. it, so I'm with you. I, I'm totally down for for watching a, a sequel of that. I it was in one of my I was thinking about it in my top as well. Oh, so, okay, yeah, cool. I'm, I'm totally Same. with you. Yeah, yeah. So looking forward to talk about like the films of 2022 that we're looking forward to. Um, do you have any in particular off the bat that like you're really pumped for? I know I have. I I chose five. Let me hear your five. Okay, all five. Do you want to? Okay. Yeah. No, I'll do all five. I'll do all five. I'm curious. We'll probably have a couple of overlaps and I'll say it when we do. Okay. So my top five, my number one most anticipated film of the year is Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Awesome. Um, So excited. Ryan Coogler rules. Um, Also, I think, you know, not going to be easy. Going to hit the feels. Um, But very excited uh, for that film of all the Marvel films coming out this year. It's the one I'm most excited for. Um, My second is... The Batman. The Batman, yes. Because I think it looks bananas great. Um, Give me the Riddler. Yeah, oh, dude, yeah. Paul Dano. Paul. First of all, Paul Dano was one of... He almost was in The Power of the Dog. Oh, oh, yeah. He I was going to play the brother. Okay. Yeah. That would... Yeah. Uh, he seems... He would be feel older for that part. No, no, not the son. The Benedict Cumberbatch's brother. Oh, instead brother. of Jesse Clemens. Yes. I gotcha. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen that. Um, so <laughs> I'm just, I'm so, I'm so excited to see him as the Riddler. And I like, I think the direction that this is taking feels really interesting to me. Um, my third is a film called Babylon that's coming out. So this is Damien Chazelle's newest film. Oh, He's going cool. back to kind of classic Hollywood story. He is telling uh, the story of Clara Bow and Margot Robbie is playing Clara Bow. Oh, wow. Now, I, I am... A smidge iffy on the casting, but I think it's going to... I Listen, I trust her, and I think it's going to be great. Mm-hmm. But Damien Chazelle handling another classic Hollywood story is like, I'm all here for. Um, my fourth is Nope, which is Jordan <laughs> Peele's upcoming film. Um, little is known about it, except it's directed by Jordan Peele, so I'm here and ready yeah, to see it. Yeah, there's very little known about very it. Very little, and I like it that way. I like <laughs> the mystery surrounding it. And then my last one is Everything Everywhere All at Once, uh, which oh, is a yes. film, you know, that is not connected to the major cinematic universes that are doing multiverse stories um so i'm really intrigued by it i think looks visually interesting and i also think it's going to be fun to do something that's a multiverse story that's not in a world that establishes like a firm multiverse of characters that you're supposed to know like i think it could be a lot more fun in some ways because you're not anticipating rather just receiving yeah another a24 film a lot making our list this year we're a24 people (laughs) that's very true (laughs) uh what about you what films are you anticipating legally bond three didn't make your list There's a new Legally Blonde movie coming yeah, out? Yeah, it's coming out this year. Okay, forget my list. <laughs> Legally uh, Blonde. <laughs> interesting year, because I mean, we got Elvis and Top Gun, which got, and Jurassic Park, or Jurassic World, uh, got all moved over. Yeah, so those would be are, interesting. Yeah. Um, we got a couple of Marvel, Doctor Strange, and Thor, Love and Thunder, um, and then they have The Flash, Avatar 2. So those are some movies that are definitely coming out this year. I did not know that Damien Chazelle had a new movie coming out, so mm-hmm. that's really awesome. I like your list. We had a couple that we agreed on. Um, uh, nope, by Jordan Jordan Peele's new movie. Yeah, we know nothing, but after his last two, we're, we're bought in. Um, the Batman, I mean, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, one that... Uh, Depending on when you listen to it, we'll probably have seen by then. Is I scream. Um, oh my god! <laughs> I think uh, it's because it's coming out it's in just a couple yeah, of days. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can't wait. Um, you know, I, I was skeptical about the West Craven not being here for it, um, but hopefully, you know, hopefully it delivers. And and what we're hearing is, you know, the original cast has been very supportive. I know they're in it, so that's complicated, but... Yeah, right, yeah. Um, and then a um, couple sequels I'm excited for. Um, 
want to see Halloween ends. Uh, I also want to see it end. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Surprised that Halloween kills didn't make Lawrence the top three least favorite films. I'm very excited for that. Um, yes. Creed 3. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Because isn't Michael B. Jordan directing it? Michael B. Jordan is directing. Yeah, Jonathan intrigued. Majors is going to be the um, opponent in it. There's not a lot being said about his connection. Hold on. <laughs> yes, you're going to get Michael B. Jordan and Jonathan Majors in the same movie together. There's nothing appropriate, I can say. <laughs> <laughs> Without sounding so thirsty, I need a Gatorade. Yeah. Uh, so November 23rd, Thanksgiving. Uh, Lauren, it's going to be very thankful. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't wrong. <laughs> I mean, you're dropping things <laughs> over here. I feel, I feel a little. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but my the movie that I'm probably the most excited for um, is going to be The Northman, uh, Robert Eggman, uh, Robert Eggers' new film. So, um, extremely, extremely excited for that. Now wait a second. Yes. Are you telling me your main squeezes new film did not make your most anticipated? Who? David Fincher has a new movie coming out called The Killer. He paired with the writer of Seven. I didn't, I didn't know that was coming out. Oh my gosh, Ryan, there's a new movie by David Fincher coming oh out this year. I need to rework it. <laughs> Start the episode over. <laughs> this changes everything. <laughs> um, my top five is now different. <laughs> so yeah, let me put that on the list. <laughs> Did not know he had another one coming out, and then especially team him up with uh, the writer of Seven. That sounds... Yes. Can I tell you, though? Uh, so I'm getting a Robert Eggers and a David Fincher film this year. Same year. Yeah. Here's the thing. Do we really want to know what has happened with the mind of the guy who wrote Seven <laughs> in the, like, 20 years since that film has been out, <laughs> also with a global pandemic? I don't know if I want to get inside there. I'm so excited to watch all of these new movies this year. But I'm really excited to show an old favorite very soon. So if you've been paying attention to our social media channels, Ryan and I are hosting a new series at the Civic Theater in their Theater 514 called Nostalgia Cinema. And for our first showing, we are going to be watching... The Goonies! This is going to be on January 29th at 4 p.m. You can currently buy tickets. Uh, we will do an intro and then a little light discussion afterwards about the film... Please come out and not only support the Theater 514, but enjoy the Goonies with us. Yeah, we can't wait to have you guys out. We're really excited. We're counting down to days for this. Uh, just to, you know, peace, keep you know keep in mind, uh, masks are required yep. when you're coming to the show uh, per the policy of the Civic Theater. Also, kind of keep update on that as things obviously always are changing, so you want to know what their newest policies are before you show up. But we can't wait to have you out. We're going to have a great time. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. So if you're not currently following us on social media, please follow us on Instagram. Instagram at How Could You Podcast, on Twitter at How Could You Pod. You can also go to our Facebook page, uh, which is linked through our Instagram. Uh, you can always send us an email suggestions to How Could You Podcast at gmail.com. And this has been our season three finale. Uh, we want to thank all of you again for listening, uh, keeping the show going, keeping us excited and coming back. Um, you know, we talk about it all the time. We, we just can't be more grateful for everybody that listens and takes the time out to to hear us and just kind of ramble and have some fun and and hopefully along the way we can make you guys laugh and, and have a good time as well um and until next time let me leave you with a my maybe one of my favorite quotes of the year from film from the film belfast if they can't understand you then they're not listening and until next time enjoy the odyssey 